So, messy Christmas. It's been a messy, a messy 2017 in all kinds of ways. Uh, it's a messy world. In this year, I just did a little bit of reflecting. You don't have to look very hard to see how messy uh, this world is. We looked at post-election divisiveness in our country. We had uh, runaway wildfires for a big part of this year that just devastated uh, whole, whole communities in terrible ways. Hurricanes, earthquakes uh, in our world that killed uh, several thousand people over the course of this year. Ongoing difficulties with North Korea, protests in our own land still about, about race. In October, we had a massacre in Las Vegas. We had a church shooting in South Texas. And around the world, terrorism, disaster. Was over 300 people killed in a terrorist act in Egypt in the last couple of days. Uh, and so many of those things aren't even on our radar because they just didn't happen in our country to people who are mostly look like us. So we don't even register some of the messiness that takes place in our world. And the rest of that is that I happen to live in this messy world. I am a resident of a messy world. And the messiness is going to impact our lives in countless ways. It's going to dig into family things, to the workplace, into communities. It's going to touch us in countless ways. And we are often overwhelmed just by the messiness of sin and it may be around us, and we just get caught up in the wake of its consequence. It may be in us, but it doesn't take long to see and to feel the world is messy and the world is broken. Fifteen years ago, I told this story. We're going to see how many of you remember this story. I think about it because it's Christmas time. When I think about messy Christmas, uh, this story came to mind. So I want to, I want to tell it again. I was, it's 1991, December. I was uh, serving on a church staff in Abilene, Texas, and gone out to make hospital visits. I was visiting a hospital on the south side of Abilene, and I walked up to the entrance of the hospital, and there he was. Now, I hadn't seen him in uh, about a year. We'd had a relationship over three years or so. Hadn't seen him in about a year. He was looking pretty rough. He was sitting on a concrete bench out in front of the hospital waiting for somebody to come pick him up. He uh, had lost, he, there wasn't a lot to him anyway, but he had lost a lot of weight. Hair, uh, he just let it be whatever it wanted to be. His beard, untrimmed, unkept. Uh, Probably hadn't bathed in, in a good long while. His name was Anthony. And uh, when I saw him, I didn't recognize him at first. I actually backed up a few steps to circle back to Anthony. And Anthony? He looked at me and, and I wrinkled up his nose. And then he said, Brother Chad. I said, man... What in the world are you doing? Uh, I went over and I sat down on the concrete bench next to him, put my arm around him and just checking in to see how he was doing. I'd been checking in on him for a good while, trying to look after him best I could for a good while. Uh, Anthony, uh, his kidneys were failing and uh, he'd been at the, for any number of medical reasons, he'd been at the hospital just trying to get a little bit of treatment, do some tests to see where this road was going to go for him. And, he had a county vehicle that, for indigent care, was coming to pick him up and to take him to a shelter. I'd met him three years earlier. He'd come to our church needing food. And, and so one of my responsibilities, I did the benevolence ministry at the church. So when someone came looking for food, they'd come to my office. We'd go through a process of asking questions, getting some information. And then we had a food pantry, and I'd go... But, leave them there, go to the food pantry, get what they needed, and then uh, fix them up with food. So I did this uh, on several times a week. People would come by. Anthony was a unique case, and I started in the food pantry keeping things just for Anthony. So I knew I'd see him once a month or so, 
And Anthony, he, uh, he, he didn't ever want anything that required preparation or a can opener. So I had to do pre-prepared food that had a pop top or some easy way to get into it because all he was going to take is what he could put into a backpack. Now, Anthony, uh, I always tried to get him into a shelter when it was cold or into a hotel when it was cold because uh, most of the time Anthony was going to sleep under an overpass. I wanted to help him all I could. Tried to get him into different programs, different ways to get him set free from the life he was living. But Anthony was a hard case and He would have none of it. Uh, He was always gracious and kind and respectful. And (sighs) but so very broken. Anthony had a family at one time. His parents still lived in a little town just outside of Abilene. And uh, he had had a wife, children. He, lived, he worked in the oil field in the 80s, and somewhere in the 80s, he, he got hurt. And in that process, he got a settlement, a couple hundred thousand dollars, he said. And that couple hundred thousand dollars, he, he blew through quickly, most of it uh, in the form of uh, cocaine. And with, between painkillers and alcohol and cocaine... He lost, his, he lost his marriage, and he lost his kids. Eventually, his parents uh, disowned him. And so that's what put Anthony on the streets and spent the night under overpasses in Abilene, Texas. In that process, he also lost most of his usable brain cells. So uh, there wasn't a lot of hope for a guy like Anthony. Now, I tried to help him whenever and as much as I could. One of the reasons he always stood out to me, and one of the reasons after that many years I still remember his name, is because we were within one month of being the exact same age. And uh, he was my ongoing reminder and continues to be, because I think of him periodically, though it's uh, highly doubtful he has survived to this day. Uh, but by the grace of God, there go I. He was a good uh, anchoring humbler for me uh, in, uh, in my life. And I remember the day that he came in and he was a little more talkative. Mind was just a little bit clearer one day. And we visited and clear enough that we were able to get to the gospel and and Anthony prayed to receive Christ. And in the middle of all the jumbled world that he lived in, you know, that's my, my hope I hang on to, is the hope of Jesus Christ. And in that day of commitment, maybe one day I'll see him in heaven. But that day, outside of a hospital in Abilene, Texas, we made an odd pair. Me, uh, that day, uh, suit and tie, and my unusual friend. Why did Jesus come? The whole reason for Christmas. Why did he come? He came to this earth because it was a mess. And he came for messy people. And he came for messy people like Anthony. And he came for messy people like me. And he came for messy people like you. And that's what the birth of Jesus Christ, the coming of the Christ to this world means to me. And over the next few weeks, we're going to look at all the reasons Jesus came. The reasons he came to a messy world. You know, we go through life and we experience messy times. And sometimes it's our fault. Sometimes we can point and say that is somebody else's fault. And sometimes it's no one's fault at all except that the world is is a mess because of sin. And we're just on the receiving end of it. We get caught up in in the storms created by sin over generations and generations and generations. And there are times when we get stuck in the messiness of this world. And just know this, when you're in those times, God is not ignorant of your situation. He is not unable in your situation. He is not absent in your messy world. 
But he enters into messy world and messy lives all the time. And that's what we want to talk about today. A mess. And a Christmas story. So I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Isaiah. I love the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 7. Now, uh, when I read through the Bible... Annually, I read through the Bible. This year, my goal was to read through the Bible twice. So I'm on track to do my second round. And I highlight as I, as I read through. So I'm on track to finish my second round through the Bible in 2017. But both times in my read through the Bible, I started with Isaiah. It is my usual pattern for how I read the Bible. I will start with Isaiah, and if possible, I will read it in a sitting. I've done this for years. Because Isaiah so marks everything Old Testament and everything that's coming in New Testament for me. It's just a good spot for a guy like me to start. And so I love the book of Isaiah, this prophet Isaiah. Now, before we get to Isaiah 7, we need some backstory on this story. And I want to pull that. It's a, we're talking, by the way, about a guy named Ahaz. Ahaz not only created a mess... But uh, he inherited a mess, and he had a mess that was coming in on him from outside. We find uh, the events of his life summarized in 2 Kings 16, 2 Chronicles 28. This is a summary of his spiritual life with the Lord, and it's fairly alarming. Here's what it says. This is 2 Chronicles 28. Ahaz was 20 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. And he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord as his father David had done. But he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. He even made metal images of the Baals. And he made offerings in the valley of the son of Hinnom. And burned his sons as an offering according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. And he sacrificed and made offerings on the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. So here's King Ahaz. He's the king of the people of God. This is after the kingdom divided. 922 B.C., Solomon died. The kingdom divided north and south. Ten northern tribes break off. They have the voice of God's prophets in the northern kingdom, but there's not one godly king. They all did what was evil in the eyes of the Lord when we raid out the 16 kings in the northern kingdom. The kings in the southern kingdom, which really is made up just of Judah and of Benjamin in the south, really wrapped around Jerusalem. Uh, there's some good kings and there's some bad kings. And Ahaz is down in the south. And he's, uh, he's not a good testimony. He did things that the most pagan na- the, the The nations that the Israelites were supposed to drive out when Joshua brought them into the promised land, but they didn't weed them out. They left remnants of these pagan peoples. So he's performing child sacrifices. And he is doing, he's worshiping the Baals, a fertility cult. Uh, built around perverse sexuality. He has embraced everything that is not from God. Now, the events and conversations recorded in Isaiah 7, they take place in the year, years 734, 733 B.C. It's a time when Ahaz had some problems with kingdoms to his north, and his life and his kingdom were at risk. What's more, and this is really all that saved him, the word of God seemed threatened. Because God said, there'll be a line of David. And that line of David you find in that genealogy in Matthew chapter 1, it covers this whole time period. It's going to take you all the way to Jesus. But it appeared the line of David was going to be destroyed by this event in Isaiah 7. So this is a big deal uh, on that end as well as for Ahaz personally. Now, into the messy life and the messy circumstances of this guy named Ahaz comes the great prophet Isaiah. And I do love Isaiah. He's considered one of the greatest men in the ancient world. He's a counselor to kings. He's a writer of this book of Isaiah. There's only one book in the New Testament more quoted than the book of Isaiah. That's the book of Psalms. Uh, I... The, old, the New Testament guys quote it. Jesus, when he preached his first sermon, he preached it from a text in Isaiah. 
Goodness, when I preached my first sermon in Raisin, Texas, I decided I better follow suit. I preached my first sermon from Isaiah chapter 6 when I preached my first sermon. I love the book of Isaiah. You find so many things, so rock solid, so, so uh, sweeping in this guy, Isaiah. Uh, really, uh, Isaiah is compared, this book is compared to Romans for it's just as a book of great theological depth, the sweeping majesty of the glory and the greatness and the holiness of God. Isaiah is a contemporary with some other guys of the 8th century prophets. You got Hosea, you got Micah, you have Amos, radically devoted to the Lord in spite of circumstances, uh, pushing hard uh, against the flow of a sinful world. And he grappled with messy times that marked the end of the 8th century uh, B.C. Now, it was this man, Isaiah, who more than any before him or after him would point toward Jesus coming. Uh, his, his book is filled up with prophecies that point toward Jesus. And, and if some of you have Bibles that mark where a biblical prophecy about Jesus can be found. You will find in Isaiah over and over again, he is pointing beyond. Now, the great part about it is, he says the coming Messiah is going to be great and glorious. And most of the Jewish people said, oh, that's awesome. But then he said he's also going to suffer. He's going to be a servant. And he's going to die for the sins of the world. And the Jewish people just couldn't figure out that part of the Messiah. How does that how, how can you mix the, the great and glorious with the suffering and the servant? But Isaiah paints that picture that will so accurately display the life of Jesus the Christ. And it points to the fact that God has great plans for his people. Great plans for us. So now I want to read first Isaiah 7 verses 1 and 2. In the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, son of Uzziah, king of Judah, Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, the king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but could not yet mount an attack against it. When the house of David was told, Syria is in league with Ephraim, the Syrians and the northern kingdom of Israel. They have joined up together against you. The heart of Ahaz and the heart of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. All of us face desperate times when life gets messy and all kinds of circumstances combine to bring us just to the brink where we feel like, okay, I'm just on the edge of everything here and I'm not sure how this is going to work out. If I'm going to be able to be free, if I'm able to break out, if, if this is where it all ends, if this is where my life comes crashing down, maybe, maybe my, my road is done. So here's Ahaz. There's a rotten part about this. He's king. And likely in his early 20s when he's facing all this. He is a young, inexperienced guy. And he's facing this national crisis. He had, a, he had a godly father, though. And a godly grandfather. They both did what was right in the eyes of the Lord when we sum up their reigns. They, they, they didn't do it perfectly. They, they weren't superstar spiritual guys. But they leaned into what God wanted them to do. Just one of those reminders. No matter how hard you try as a parent. No matter your influence as a grandparent. Sometimes uh, children are going to make their own way, and that's what Ahaz did. Maybe he thought it's time to update how we do things here in Jerusalem. Maybe he thought he could do a better job. Maybe he thought we could expand our influence if we'd stop being so, so tethered to this, this Old Testament kind of God. Mostly, he just didn't think much about the God of his fathers. This much we know for sure. When he became king, God was not in his plans or on his mind. He's one of those guys, like a lot, really, you walk the streets of uh, Allen, Texas, walk around in Collin County, you're going to find a lot of this. They had, he had a form of religion. He had, he's, he's a religious guy. He just didn't have a relationship to God. He had pieced things together the way it made sense to him. He had constructed his own God. Really, it's an idolatry like most people. Most people that you're going to run into in this community are idol worshipers because they've constructed a God, a little of this, a little of that, a little of this idea. Here's the God I worship. Well, now the God I serve, this is how it works with him. And 
were idolaters. Not the God of the Bible, not the God as he's revealed himself in his perfect eternal word, but instead a lesser, small g kind of God. And that's, that's what Ahaz had done. And now trouble has come to his doorstep and his idolatry is not helping him at all. He doesn't have a spiritual well to draw from when, uh, when his resources seem done. He hasn't developed a faith that is test worthy. I'll tell you something about the faith. Uh, I'm amazed how many times I have conversations with people who say, well, if there was really a God, if God really cared, I would never have problems in my life. Well, you're thinking about a magic genie from the cartoons. You're not thinking about God. God has eternal purposes in mind for you, and that means there are always going to be tests. And just consider that as we move into this season. Is your, is your faith test-worthy? If it all wasn't going great, if things weren't rolling your way, would, would you still be okay? Do you have a faith that would endure, that could, that could carry you forward in such times? Here's a summary statement of Ahaz's life and reign. It says, he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And really, when you come to the end of your life, that's really the only thing that's going to matter. Did you do what was right in the eyes of the Lord? Well, let me tell you, I built this business. I accomplished these things. I live in this house. I bought this car. I, my kids accomplished these things. Did you do what was right in the eyes of the Lord? Because we're all going to stand before him and give an account. 734 B.C., Syria, capitals Damascus, and Israel, that northern kingdom that's distanced itself from God, uh, capital Samaria, they decided we have a problem looming for us and we're going to have to address this problem. So they, they created this partnership because they see a threat come in their way. And that threat was the Assyrian Empire. Now you have Syria and you have Assyria. Syria is in Damascus. Assyria, capital city, is Nineveh. You heard of Nineveh before. You remember your, your Jonah story. The Assyrians were a brutal, horrible, violent, warring people. And they were expanding their empire in the 8th century. And they were eating up these little city-states and these smaller nations, uh, taking them over, and it was violent, and it was ugly, and they were horrible people. And so you have Syria, and you have the northern kingdom of Israel. They said, we have to get together, or we're going to be swallowed up by these guys. And then they start looking south toward Jerusalem. And this young, inexperienced king named Ahaz. And they thought, we don't know what he's going to do, and we really don't care. Because I think what we need to do to make sure we don't have anyone attacking us from the south in the middle of Assyria coming at us from the north. And also, maybe we could combine forces. Ahaz won't join up with us. Why don't we just go down, take Jerusalem, knock Ahaz off the throne, and then there'll be three of us. We'll put our own guy on. Three of us, three nations together, maybe we could hold out against the mighty Assyrians. So this is their plan. Well, verse 2 says, Ahaz wasn't very excited about that. Oh, I'm the king. Just barely, but I'm the king. And I, I, I don't want to be kicked off the throne. I don't want the nation taken from me. And these guys are obviously more experienced. There's more of them. And I'm not sure how I'm going to be able to hold out against them. And there's a, there's a subtle hint in our passage here in uh, Isaiah 7, you find it outright spoken in 2 Kings 17 where some of these stories overlap in the history books of the Bible. Ahaz was trying to figure out what am I going to do and one of the things he would thought of is maybe I need an alliance. But instead of aligning with Syria and Israel, he says against Sy uh, Assyria, he says... I got this idea. What if I line up with Assyria? And that's the coalition he's looking at. He's going to line up with the evil empire is his plan. So all those things are in works. Now, like a lot of people in messy situations, some of you in a messy situation right now, you've been in those times when things are hard, so whether it's family or work or wherever it falls for you. In messy situations, what do we do? We, 
We just look for a quick fix. Now, we probably didn't get into the mess we're in in a hurry, but we think we can get out of it in a hurry. And so we'll do some kind of knee-jerk reaction thing to get ourselves free that actually is going to dig a deeper hole for us. And this is what we find with Ahaz, is not only does he, he finds himself in a deep hole, but he's one of those guys that he can't stop digging. It keeps getting deeper and deeper and deeper. And some of you have done those sorts of things where instead of just stepping back from the mess, you just keep leaning into it and looking in all the wrong places. So Ahaz is a guy, he's planting seeds of destruction. Seeds of destruction. And it's going to end up yielding a harvest that will devastate him and devastate his family, devastate his legacy. Now, into this fearful hour comes Isaiah, and he has a word from the Lord. Now, verse, verse 3, verse 3 tells us that the prophet finds the king doing a care, and there's a, there's a complicated description here. It's not the only time it occurs, not the only king with which it occurs in the scriptures, but the description tells us exactly where he was in Jerusalem. He was checking the city's water supply. Also, from the vantage point of where he was, he was checking the city's water supply. He was also able to see the city's fortifications. Remember, Jerusalem is a wall city. And if you have an enemy army coming and you're in a wall city, you have a lot of defensive position to take advantage of. So, in a defensive position, defensive uh, forces, you can hold them off for a good while. So, the enemy army knows this. It's too dangerous for them to just head on frontal assault. So they'll circle up around the city and they'll lay siege to the city for a while. And then it's all a matter of how long will their water hold out inside and how long will their food hold out on the inside of the walls and can we hold out on the outside with our water and our food longer than they can do it on the inside. And eventually maybe there's a battle that's going to be fought when they feel like uh, defenses are weakening. So... This is what Ahaz is doing. He's looking to see how things are going to go. And he's hoping Assyria will come to his rescue. And it's in that context that Isaiah gives Ahaz some insight into the heart of God. And it is a heart he does not know. The Lord says in verse 3 to Isaiah, Go out to meet Ahaz, you and Shear Yeshub. Any of you? How many Shear Yeshubs? Even your middle name? Anybody? Just one? Okay. Share your shoe. Your son. I don't know. Okay, this is a big, this is a big moment. Why don't you bring... Your big moment, you're going to go meet the king. Why don't you take your son with you? Well, God had a good reason for that. At the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the, to the washer's field. That's where he was looking over his water supply. And say to him, Be careful. Be quiet. Do not fear. Do not let your heart be faint because of these two smoldering stumps of firebrands at the fierce anger of Rezin in Syria and the son of Remaliah because Syria with Ephraim and the son of Remaliah has devised evil against you, saying, Let us go up against Judah and terrify it. Let us conquer it for ourselves. And let us set up the son of Tabael. This is, uh, they're going to put their own guy on the throne as the king in the midst of it. For thus says the Lord God. By the way, you don't know what any situation is about until you know what the Lord says. It shall not stand. It shall not come to pass. It shall not stand. It shall not come to pass. So, here's Isaiah. He's used of God to bring clarity and truth to the places in Ahaz's heart where things are dark and confused. He's trapped in this messy life. He's trapped in this messy world. He is far from God. There are three things I want to be sure that you get from this story. The first one is, God always has a word for you in your day of trouble. Now, what do we say? God, where are you? God, why don't you speak? God, why aren't you working? God, why aren't you intervening? God always has a word for you in your day of trouble. Here's the king, and he's not by himself on that At that spot, he's with his whole staff, probably several of his military officers, pretty good crowd around him. And they're scrambling to inspect their water supply to make sure they can hold out, their fortifications to be sure they'll hold up. And Isaiah shows up with his young son. Now, names are important in the Bible. Sometimes it is just a name, but these biblical names 
most of the time, they, they also carry a spiritual significance. They mean something. And so here's Isaiah and his young son, Shear Yeshub. And that's the one that God told him to take because of his name. See, those names, Isaiah means Yahweh is salvation, the Lord. When you, in the Old Testament, when you find a, usually a translation that says capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, not capital L, O, R, D, but it's all capitalized. It's the word that God used with Moses at the burning bush. You tell them the Lord sent you, Moses. It's the covenant name for God. It's the, it's the, it's the big relationship with his people name for God. So that's Lord. L the Lord is salvation. That's what Isaiah's name means. Shear Yeshub means a remnant shall remain. Okay. It would have been better for Ahaz if they had both had t-shirts, like matching t-shirts, except they both had the name. A remnant shall return. The Lord is salvation. And they just stood there in front of him for a while so he could soak in because he wasn't a real bright bulb. Think about this. Think about this. Their names themselves are a message from the Lord in that moment for that time. That's why his son had to go. The idea is Ahaz, the reason the two of us are here, just by our very names. I'm Isaiah. This is Shear Yashub is because God has the ability to save you and to preserve you. God wants to save you and God wants to preserve you. So, Here's the thing. Ahaz missed this completely, apparently, in all kinds of ways. He missed a lot in all kinds of ways. Here's the thing. When you're crying out to the Lord in the middle of messiness, why is it God doing things? Where is, the, where is God in all this? Why doesn't God fix this? God is probably screaming at multiple places in your life. But until you seek him, until you turn to him, until you tune into him, you're probably going to miss it no matter how much. How loud, how close that voice is, that declaration is. If you're not in his word, if you're not in his church, if you're not in community with God's people, you're going to miss a whole lot of what, what, what God is saying to you. If you're not spending daily time in prayer where you're not just talking all the time, but you're saying, God, I need to know, could you tell me something? And now I'm going to start listening for a little while instead of continuing to yap. You're going to miss a lot of what God has to say. God always has a word for you in those messy times. Here's the second thing. God is always bigger than what you fear. He is always bigger than what you fear. Isaiah says it in every way it can be said in verse 4. Be careful, be quiet, do not fear, do not let your heart grow faint. These two smoldering stumps of firebrands, all smoke, no fire. When you, when you have sticks in a fire and it burns through and there's a piece that falls away from the fire, it's still smoldering on one end, nothing's happened on the other end, that's what he's talking about. That's what these guys are. There's nothing big, bold, scary about these two knuckleheads from the north. You don't need to investigate your defenses. You don't have to form questionable alliances, Ahaz, don't you realize? See, Rezin, he has jurisdiction over Israel. And Pekah, he has jurisdiction over Syria. Ahaz, I'm the king of kings and lord of lords. I rule the whole world. I created it all. Why don't you look to me instead of looking at them? Why don't you look beyond to the greater message? Smoke, no fire. In 65 short years, their nations won't even exist anymore, he tells them. Now, i tell you what's going to happen. Ahaz, here's what's going to happen. Nothing. These guys are no threat to you. They will never attack. Stop living by sight. Start believing by faith. I am for you. This is the, this is the recalibrating of our hearts that has to happen. God is for you. You can trust him. You can trust him in the big things. You can trust him in the little things. You can trust him in the joyous things. You can trust him in the dark things. You can trust him because he's working a bigger plan than you can see or even understand. Do you believe this about God? Do you believe this about God? It is not an easy thing because it's a step of faith. Faith always costs you something. It's gonna, what do you fear most? Is that too difficult for him? 
Do you trust God when the chips are down, when everything, resources are spent, you're tired, you're tense? Then Isaiah adds a little incentive, and this is important. He's done the positive in the second thing that we shared. Here's the third thing. If you don't live by faith, here's the negative consequence. If you don't live by faith, everything in your life will come unglued. Everything in your life is going to unravel. Verse 9 states the spiritual principle. If you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. If you don't nail down your confidence in God beyond all circumstances, if you don't hold fast to the one who made you, who controls this world, you're just making stuff up. And so many people who say, oh, I know God, I know he's out there, but, but yet you're flailing and writhing all on your own. But if you'll depend on him, he will meet you right where you are, and he will help you take the next step and the next step and the next step. He'll guide you. It doesn't mean, oh, if I trust God, nothing bad will ever happen to me, as we define bad. Because God's working all things together for good to those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. So he's going to take even the worst things that you're experiencing in your life. He'll make things beautiful, great, glorious of those things. God so wanted Ahaz to embrace this great truth. I am with you always. You can trust me. And then Isaiah says one of the craziest things in the, in the context of Scripture that we ever run into. And I don't know when you started, I mean, when you really started getting ready for Christmas. Some of you, I know, you've been working on this for several months. Before the retailers got around to it in September, you were already working on Christmas. Well, God was working on Christmas from time eternal. This whole story of Jesus coming, God's been preparing in great detail for a very, very long time. And uh, he gives a great declaration in Isaiah chapter 7. And in the middle of talking to Ahaz about all these things, he brings the Christmas story to bear on the story. And it always puts hope in my heart. The Lord spoke to Ahaz. I'm calling you to trust me. I'm going to show you that I am more than able to handle your dilemma. Ask me for a sign. Ask me for any sign. And, I'll, and I will, I'll, I'll give it to you. And uh, so what happens in those verses is that then Ahaz goes all spiritual and says, Oh, I'm not going to ask for a sign. I'm not going to put the Lord to the test. No, what he means is, I've already made up my mind. I'm going to do what I think is best, and I really don't want God's input into my life. I want him to bless what I'm going to do, but I have no interest in hearing his words on this topic. And in that moment, Isaiah, who had been talking to King Ahaz, he shifts, and his audience gets bigger. There's an audience there. And Ahaz, talks. To, he's talking to Ahaz, like he steps back, and now he's talking to the crowd. And this is the message that he gives. Verses 13 and 14. Hear then, O house of David. This is bigger than just Ahaz. Hear then, O house of David. Is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore, anyway, Ahaz said, or Isaiah said to Ahaz, I'll ask for a sign. I'm not going to do it. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And I think in the gathered crowd, virgin shall conceive and bear a son. You shall call his name Emmanuel. Here is your great hope. And in that context, I think the gathered crowd waiting for the great word from the great prophet just looked at each other and said, what did he say? Of all things, a baby. That, that's all you got? Th this, this just doesn't sound right. Did, did, he, did he really just say that? In the Bible, a sign is defined as a, as a signal, as a beacon, as a monument, as something you, you drive a stake into the ground, something obvious, a purpose pointing to a greater truth that God is intervening, that God's at work, that God's on the job. He's accomplishing, he's accomplishing something far beyond what we can imagine. He's touching the eternal. And this sign involves the birth of a child after impossible pregnancy because it's a virgin who will have a baby. And because God is the one who does the impossible and the miraculous that touches the eternal, he can 
do it as he wills for you. He's a God who can do things that no one can do. He's a God of, of heaven and of earth. He can do anything. And this is an example of him doing the impossible. And Ahaz, he can do the impossible for you. The name Emmanuel means God with us, the strong God with us. In other words, uh, God himself is coming. In fact, he's going he's to come to this very city of Jerusalem. And he's going to set what right, what is wrong, and he's going to change everything. And Ahaz, you can trust me. Don't rely on men. Don't rely on armies. Don't rely on coalition forces. Lean on me. And then a little over 700 years after Isaiah spoke those words, a young woman named Mary, who was betrothed to a man named Joseph, had a visit from an angel who told her she was going to be the human vehicle through which the Messiah would be born, and she would conceive and bear a son, even though she was still a virgin. And somewhere in the confusion of this surprising, miraculous pre uh, pregnancy, this prophet gives a word of hope to Ahaz because a lot of what Isaiah says speaks to his generation and then speaks well beyond. So when, when that example happens in Matthew's gospel, Matthew, the Holy Spirit reminds him, wait a minute, a virgin conceived and bore, I've heard that before. And he went back to Isaiah 7. And he quotes that passage because it all came to pass, just as God said, and it will be for all people. And you can trust him with your problems, and you can believe his promises, and, and you can hang on when it feels too hard to hang on, and you'll get to see all the things God can do because God does impossible, miraculous, eternal things. And when life is messy... And some of you, today life is messy. Some of you can give testimony of the messes that you have made your way through, that you're still trying to make your way through. But you can trust in a God who sent his son to be the savior of the world. And this is why Christmas happened. To demonstrate what God could do and how he could do it. And so Jesus came to this broken, messy world, and he came to my broken, messy world, and he comes into your broken, messy world to make all things new because that's just what he does because he's the Savior. And I want you to see this word of hope from the 8th century B.C., a word of hope that says there's hope for you today. Whatever messy things have arisen in your life. The messy things that you feel that you came in here carrying, there is hope because Jesus Christ has come and you can trust him because he loves you. If he could love Ahaz, he can love you. And he's aware and he's able. He's engaged. Turn to him today.